Mambo and welcome to Dawi Kudin. My guest tonight is Honorable Chairperson of Royal Civil Service Commission, uh, Mr. Kamar Sidimla. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll just uh, pick on from where we left uh, during Zonka session. So I think uh, one thing that uh, people expect Royal Civil Service Commission to operate is in a very transparent, yes. very fair and also in a very accountable manner. Yes. Is it happening now? Yes, uh, I believe it is now actually in terms of fairness, accountability, those are the principles uh, which the civil service uh, aspires to and if you look at uh, all the things that we do, uh, by any standard I would say that uh, that we do do things in a most uh, transparent and accountable manner. Yes, sir. So does that mean media will have more access to information from Royal Civil Service Commission and for that matter agencies? and uh, civil servants working in uh, service, la, civil service. La. Because until now, it has yes. been quite difficult for media to get information or get access to information from civil service. And yes. civil servants would hardly talk to media. La. Yes. Well, uh, in terms of the civil service, uh, uh, we are going to do things based on principles. Yes. And therefore, we have no hesitation sharing what the principles are based on which we take decisions. Yes. And uh, so... Uh, other than divulging sensitive personal information, uh, we really don't have a uh, problem sharing with the media what it is we are aspiring to. Indeed, uh, uh, we believe that it's probably in the interest of the country that it knows uh, what sort of system the civil service is being built on because the future of the country, uh, as His Majesty very clearly highlighted in the National Day Address last year, uh, depends very much on the civil service. And uh, so it's in all our interest that we build a very strong civil service based on principles that we all aspire and want, uh, wish to uphold. Yes. So you're almost about uh, three months yes. in the commission. Um, it will be too early to ask any major changes or reforms uh, by the, uh, initiated by the commission so far. But uh, until now, within this uh, three months, what are some of the major steps taken? by the new commission? Well, uh, the major step we have taken basically is actually to try to consult uh, in this uh, three months as many civil service servants as possi uh, po possible to understand what really are the challenges yes. that, uh, that uh, constrain the civil service from unleashing its full potential. Yes. Uh, we have a civil service made up of highly educated people. Probably in terms of diversity, we might be among the best Yes. Uh, very few civil s service will have civil servants educated from Australia to Norway to every other part of the world, which is something we have because uh, we didn't have many of these higher institutions in the past. And uh, so uh, 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 this is something we could continue to build. Yes, sir. It could be true to say that uh, we would have one of the most qualified uh, civil services. But are all these qualified civil servants educated? Because... There are instances where some people just go out, come back without so much of education, but qualification is there. So does that really help uh, strengthening the civil service? Uh, well, uh, our experience shows that actually our uh, civil servants come back with qualification and skills. And uh, what we need to do is improve the system so that we can unleash their full potential. And indeed, during our five years, that's the area we want to focus on. What can we do to get more done by this uh, group of very talented uh, people that we have in the civil service? Yes, sir. So are you going to continue talking to the civil servants and uh, are you going to listen to their voices? Because we haven't heard of this being done before. Maybe this could have been done, but it may not have been uh, publicized through media. But are you going to continue what you are doing? Or will this be a case of new broom sweeping well? Uh, no, we certainly plan to do because we find that our job has to do with people and therefore we need to understand things closely. Yes. The Royal Civil Service can't be a, a wish-fulfilling tree. Clearly some of our reforms will have casualties and indeed those casualties will be the cost of the reforms to make our civil service better than it is today. Yes. So um, in 1999, uh, the government then took uh, a major reform initiative to restructure administrative system uh, towards enhancing good governance. And the theme of this reform is our efficiency, transparency, and accountability. 
I have already raised this again, but uh, to reiterate, transparency is the key factor here and if things are done transparently, efficiency and accountability follow uh, transparency. So how much will you be able to promote transparency, not just in the commission, but civil service as a whole? Well, we are trying to promote it through a number of mechanisms that are already in place, uh, starting from strong rules, the institute of an HR audit system to ensure there's compliance, the establishment of human resource committees, so no important decisions are taken by individuals, but it's done in a setting which ensures greater accountability, transparency. Uh, so uh, this will continue to do. So nepotism, favoritism, and recruitment, trainings, promotions, these issues worry you? Does these issues worry you? Uh, certainly, of course, they do worry us. Uh, but we have to remember at the end of the day, uh, as long as people are involved, they cannot be uh, really a true objectivity. Uh, we can't escape the fact that we are in a small society. But as long as people do things based on principles which uphold meritocracy, I think should we should be okay. And by and large, what we see is that with all the strong oversight agencies we have, um, accountability has uh, been enhanced. And I think a lot of this kind of views and perceptions people hold are probably more from the past than in the present. So if these issues do worry you, then uh, what kind of well, grievance redressal mechanism you put in place? For instance, as I already asked in Zonka session, that a subordinate who would be very committed, dedicated, sincere, honest, would want to go against the superior who may not be as committed as the subordinate. But because he is superior to him, he may not be able to lodge complaints openly, fearing repercussions. So what kind of mechanisms do you have put in place? Well, the main mechanism we are thinking of uh, during our tenure is to institute something in the Royal Civil Service Commission as a place uh, basically set up as a counselling place yes. where people can come and air their grievances. Uh, our Act also requires, and maybe it is, uh, I think it's there also in the Constitution, the establishment of a tribunal. Yes. So Royal Civil Service Commission itself is an appellate uh, body, but for issues with us also we can have another body. So putting these mechanisms in place will probably address some of those concerns. Yes. Now, decentralization policies. Uh, you have decentralized recruitment in operational positions uh, in 2007. In 2008, you decentralized short-term trainings, six months and below, and again, a promotion below P2 level. How well are these uh, decentralization uh, policies adopted by RCC working well, we have not uh, carried out a study to assess how well they are working. Uh, but if you look at uh, what we hear uh, going on in agencies, uh, we don't s hear that many complaints. Yes. Nowadays, with so much social media, etc., if this kind of rampant violations are going on, people find many ways to ventilate their frustrations. But the fact that we s don't hear many of this uh, probably shows that things are working as uh, as uh, in line with the rules and regulations and mechanisms we have established. But sir, as a, uh, as a commission, would you take stock or would you take into account what is there on social media? Because if you go by what is written and what is posted on social media, then most of the writers or most of the people who post this could be maintaining anonymity. So how much water would it hold? Well, of course, officially we don't entertain anonymous uh, kind of complaints, but uh, it's in our interest to use all information because if there is truth behind it, then of course, overall objective should be to ensure merit uh, systems for meritocracy established are upheld. So uh, we do uh, take stock, though we may not give it formal uh, recognition, but we do use it as one source of feedback as to what is going on. It's, a, it's an indicator. We cannot deny uh, social media is here to stay now. Yes, so uh, just to put it on record, I'm going to repeat uh, what I asked in Zonkala. When you announce vacancies, when you advertise uh, posts, people have allegations that 
not many, but some people uh, have allegations that you announce and advertise the posts of Laura very well. But for a certain level in the higher rung, you just do it discreetly. How much would you believe uh, in this? I, um, Will this be true? Sir? I think it shows uh, ignorance of the systems that are in place. Because if you understand the system, the lower rungs are widely advertised because that's the nature of recruitment into those positions which have been decentralized. For the higher rungs, they are done through what we call open competition, where there are uh, panels made up of a number of people who, who uh, undertake the whole process of selecting people to those higher positions. So at all levels, uh, there's mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, in fact, I know of no situation where one or two person can just decide yes. on their own. For every person being promoted or uh, being appointed somewhere, there are criteria as to what sort of performance he should have uh, achieved in terms of his performance evaluation ratings, so on and so forth. Yes. So now you mentioned about open selection. Uh, when it comes to open selection, there's again this premeditated perception to some people that uh, open selection can also be considered or construed as pre-selected uh, uh, interviews being conducted. Well, uh, as far as uh, I, I can see, and when I was in the GNS Commission, I had been involved in some of these panels. They are run pretty transparently. Yes. But I guess the nature of the system is such that for every one position being filled, there are about five, six applicants. So then there's going to be five, six people who are unhappy. Yes. And uh, so I, I'm not surprised that there are uh, those kind of thoughts. But actually the system uh, is pretty transparent. Uh, it uh, involves a number of people. Uh, so uh, a lot of this kind of uh, underhand things I do not think actually happen. Yes. Uh, in 2007, His Majesty he said that uh, strengthening civil service would be the first step to creating a strong foundation of successful democracy. Keeping this in mind, how much would you stress, as the chairperson of Royal Civil Service Commission, how much would you stress in putting right people in right place? I think that's actually the most important uh, way to ensure that the civil service can achieve the national objectives that the country has. And uh, so, really, uh, what we see going forward is one of the reforms is to improve the Bhutan civil service system, particularly um, some of the elements of position classification system that were introduced, which uh, tried to fulfill this uh, principle of right person for the right job. But in terms of implementation, we see had led to some odd outcomes. Yes. Uh, the best example is a number of teachers who, after a lot of education and a lot of experience, suddenly start going as dumpers, etc. So we see that these are probably areas where we need to reform to make yes. sure that people in whom we have invested heavily continue to give us returns in those areas. And uh, we need to do that. Uh, that's one of the areas. Uh, we see it probably about of five areas that we need to work on based on three months consultation that we have carried out. We'll carry out some more consultations. So the 81st session of National Assembly passed a resolution that Royal Civil Service Commission be reconstituted and strengthened that so that RCC does not or civil service does not uh, become politicized. Now, how do you interpret this word a political? We hear no. this quite often, no. but the interpretations actually differ. Well, uh, our definition or our outlook on what it means to be apolitical is as spelled out uh, in our civil service rules and regulation, uh, which is to, to provide uh, your neutral, independent, professional opinion without fear or favor. Yes. That's really uh, the bottom line as to what it means to be apolitical. And have, as long as civil servants can do that, then in many areas, the final decision, of course, lies with the political leadership of the day. But they have the benefit of the civil servants' disinterested views. And, uh, but, of course, having received the views, they also have the right within the laws to take the decision they want. Yes. So, but will this ever happen? Because uh, when we talk to some of the civil servants informally, yes. for instance, the recent pay hike, 
Yes. Uh, we have had uh, several number of civil servants calling us and uh, sharing their views informally. Of course, they wouldn't want to share their views formally because they know that uh, they might have to fear, uh, face some repercussions. Fearing that they share their views informally and when they tell us, uh, they say that uh, they are not happy with the decision taken by National Assembly. But then again, not able to voice it out because they feel that uh, government of the day wouldn't be happy if they raise their voice. Now, in a situation like this, are you going to say that uh, by not raising their voice, you would believe that uh, they are remaining apolitical or even by raising their voice, they would be remaining apolitical? How do you interpret this? Well, I'm not, uh, I, I don't really have a comment on those informal ways civil servants share their views on periods, etc. But all I can see is, is that government is probably trying to provide something, but within the confines of very tight budgetary situation. And, uh, and uh, uh, like I said earlier, this is the uh, authority of the government of the day. I think whatever they decide, we have to work within it. We in the Royal Civil Service Commission, we are more focused on dealing with the challenges of strengthening the civil service so that it can deliver the achievement of national objectives better. And if you're able to do that, then a period of prosperity should come, um, uh, following which hopefully civil servants uh, and indeed society at large can benefit from uh, development, economic prosperity, etc. Honorable Chairperson, my question again to, as a follow-up to this question is, can civil servants comment or express their views on certain decisions passed by the parliament or by the government? And again, will they be considered apolitical if they express their views? Or maybe, for instance, if they express displeasure on certain de decisions taken by the government? Well, as per our rules and regulations, uh, for their professional views, they're supposed to give um, without fear and favor, as I mentioned. Yes. But on other aspects, I think we have to go by the decisions of the government of the day who has that authority. Yes. Yes. So to move on, uh, there was this uh, issue on discontinuing, continuing education. Uh, what is the decision taken so far? Are you yet to take decision? You have mentioned in Quinzel that uh, you are going to study yes. the possibilities. Yes. So, any studies done so far? Yes. Uh, well, we just identified uh, that as one of the areas of concerns that we feel we need to look into yes. with a view to try and address it. Basically, uh, I think there was maybe some misperception. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are not talking about continuing education at large. Indeed, we are not talking about taking away the rights of people for continuing education. All we felt is maybe the civil service system should not support continuing education for a first degree because the cost and consequences for the civil service is quite high. Yes. And by that I mean, in fact today as we speak, 856 civil servants who joined after class 12 are now, are now undergoing continuing education for a first degree. Yes. And this has tremendous cost. They, were, uh, they joined work to work, but now they are studying. And maybe this also led to the explosion in the growth of the government because their positions have to be filled up. Yes. They're studying for three years. It's difficult to leave it vacant. And in the end, the first degree is really the entry degree into the civil service. Yes. And uh, entry degree, especially for general um, arts, etc. There's uh, excess supply. Yes. So in that situation, it does not make sense that the system supports that. However, of course, the right of people to do see, we feel we should uh, find a way to allow it. So I think this is the uh, this is where we'll have to study it further and find a middle path. Yes. In case if you discontinue continuing education, then if those people who wish to continue their studies are made to resign from civil service, can they join civil service again uh, by no. sitting for uh, well, civil service exam? Uh, that's one of the possibilities we are looking so that we can uphold their right to do C, but at the same time place the cost and risk on them of leaving to do uh, continuing education for a first degree.
So that could be one possibility, but the real decision will be taken only following further consultations because we need to understand what is happening in every sector yes. before we take a decision. While you take decisions, uh, you mentioned about uh, consulting various stakeholders, but uh, in the back of your mind, are you also aware that uh, there are some people who accuse Royal Civil Service Commission of not letting people uh, go for higher education or upgrade their qualification? Uh, well, you know, any reform will have casualties. Yes. And uh, our hope is that we can share the people, the principle based on where making these changes and uh, that they will support it because they see it's in the interest of building a strong civil service system. We hope they can look beyond their personal cases when it comes to decisions like this. But this is uh, something yet to be decided. Yes. So uh, it has been the mandate and vision of Royal Civil Service Commission that uh, you have a very compact, efficient civil service. And uh, one of the major concerns that you raised in Zonkha session was uh, that uh, the number of uh, civil servants have been going up, has been growing up. So if that's the case, then on the other hand, you also need to look at ways and means to employ people as promised by the government. So one hand you talk about employment, on the other hand you talk about uh, compact and efficient civil service. Where do you draw the lines? Well, how these two uh, can come together is if we can have a compact civil servant that can deliver the country's development goals, then the development goals itself has as its targets full employment, etc. And uh, that's what we are aspiring to do. When we say we want a compact and efficient government, we don't mean uh, just for its own sake and leaving large uh, number of youth unemployed, uh, unemployed. Real measure of how good a government will be, whether compact and efficient it can deliver on the development goals and our feeling is if we work in a concerted manner we can deliver that we can have a compact and efficient government but we can make sure it uh, leads to achievement of development objectives which includes among others uh, gainful employment for all those who are looking for work uh, we see that this can come together on the other hand if we look to the civil service as an employer then I fear that this would not be good for the uh, development prospects of our country. No, sir. Uh, sir, now, one issue uh, and one, uh, one challenge, one of the many challenges that your commission would be facing would be to motivate civil servants no, and uh, deliver services on time and uh, deliver services efficiently. Now, if you go by BCSR 2002, I'll just read out what was there on your website. Uh, BCSR 2002 emphasized merit, excellence, and professionalism in civil service. Honesty, integrity, sincerity, and selflessness were added to core values of civil service. Are we going to have a civil service like it was mentioned here? It looks quite beautiful and wonderful on paper, but are we having or are we gearing towards the kind of civil service that is mentioned here? Because today, if you not uh, many, you would be doing the same, but. Uh, Quite a good number of people, as many would say, is that civil servants are seen uh, playing games, Facebooking during office hours, and uh, you know ignoring people or ignoring clients who are there to avail services. This may not be the case with all of them, but there are some who would be doing this. How can you bring reforms to all this uh, situation prevalent? Well, uh, that's going to be, I think, the task before us. Uh, but we feel that the people who are doing the type of things you mentioned are a minority. Yes. Majority of civil servants are there doing their duty. Yes. Indeed, in very difficult conditions, having been around the country as a GNH Commission Secretary, I've seen even in the most remote areas, uh, Lunana, Rangsi, everywhere, people really striving, working hard, manning their stations. You go to a basic health unit, it's well stocked, there's someone to deal with. Uh, you know, whoever clients come, etc. So, majority of the civil servants, I believe, are doing the best they can. Now, if they need to do more, we need to bring some reforms to strengthen the civil service system, make sure investments go into the right areas, make sure pay is good so that we attract the best, 
and we retain and motivate them through number of initiatives and that's why we're also looking to doing things like civil service welfare as one area of reform going forward in our tenure. But I think the civil servants will have to wait for quite some time for their pay to be good. Well, uh, our hope is uh, we are hope, uh, to going to aiming to carry out all the uh, reforms we, we feel we need to undertake during the first two years of our tenure, so that it leaves us almost three years to solidify it and uh, really strengthen the civil service system, so that civil servants can deliver the development objectives. And like I was mentioning, if they deliver the development objectives that are spelled out in the eleventh plan. Um, the, the future economic or otherwise should be good, not just for civil servants, but for the country as a whole. Yes. Maybe as a source of, as a matter of information, uh, Honorable Chair, are you receiving feedbacks or complaints uh, from the civil servants on the recent pay hike uh, drama or the episode uh, that uh, if you suddenly go through some of the social media write-ups, lots of things written and some people even... Uh, they may not necessarily be civil servants. Things yes. could be politicized on social for online forums. But uh, some strange things written, for instance, one would be that uh, taking mass leave, where all civil servants can ask leave and uh, not uh, deliver things on time. So issues like this, does well, it worry you? Uh, of course, I've seen some of those on social media. I've seen them on your program also. Uh, and of course, uh, it does worry me. But I feel those civil servants are again a minority, and and uh, what I would uh, request all of them is to focus on the work at hand, yes, and to focus on what we can do something about, and that is really about delivering you know, the development objectives to the highest satisfaction, yes. uh, in line with the calling made by His Majesty the King during the last uh, National Assembly, uh, National Day celebrations. I think that's what we should focus on. And if we focus on that and achieve those, uh, then, as I was saying, the period of uh, prosperity and uh, will come, and then we can uh, look forward to a time when not only civil servants, but country at large can benefit. Yes, sir. So, a uh, final question, maybe just to repeat uh, what was asked in Zonka, uh, just to place it on record. RCSE is not keen about uh, keen on uh, discontinuing preliminary exam. So, if you could stress on that. Well, uh, the the former commission also had submitted a report to the present government, who had asked it to look uh, to look at the prospect of doing away with preliminary exam. Yes. Uh, that was in December. That report was submitted. Uh, our commission, the second commission, we received a letter in June. Uh, again asking us to look at this issue once again in line with the government's pledge to do it away. We have looked at the matter closely and we find that that uh, the preliminary exam and the main exam, the two-tiered uh, process, is really a process set up to ensure that we get the best and the brightest yes. and that if we reduce this to one, the chances that that is uh, undermined or diluted is quite high and therefore we felt the need to continue. Uh, with the PE and ME and indeed in the course of that research what we find in neighboring countries whose civil service are strong they have actually even more layers uh, at least three. Yes, sir. So as the Honorable Chairperson of Royal Civil Service Commission uh, since this is your first interview I'd like to offer you this platform to pass any message you would have to the entire civil service lesson. Well, the only message I have is the same message I was, uh, me and my colleagues in the commission have been sharing during our visits uh, around to the Zonkaks as well as our meetings with the ministries, the government secretaries, the, the commissions, the constitutional bodies, uh, which is that, uh, that civil servants have the capability to confront all the development challenges of the day. The question is really whether we rise up to it or not. And we feel we can, that we can become a civil service, like the best civil service in the world eh, that you see around. And uh, that if our country is going to go from the stage it is today, which you could say is a stage at which we have achieved the minimums in terms of minimum standard of living, yes. a minimum um, uh, you know, capabilities in terms of health, education, <coughs> 
to a state of flourishing of maximums of GNH, then firstly the civil service must move from where it is now to another uh, level. And this is the, the reforms we will carry out in these two years is to try and do that. And we, what we look forward is that all civil servants will be behind us fully as we seek to do that. And if we can do that, as I was saying, I think we can achieve uh, all that we have outlined in the 11th plan and beyond. Yes. So we wish you all the best. And on this very positive note, we would like to end our program. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here, sir. With this, we come to the end of our program. That was Honorable Chairperson of Royal Civil Service Commission, Karmachitim. Thank you so much for watching the Vikutin, and it's time to say good night. Tashdalela.